the Solomon Islands, deep in the South Pacific. An ancient land ripped apart by war. Two mighty nations, Japan and America, fight for control of these tiny spits of land. Into this fiery cauldron comes a privileged young man from Harvard. A young man unprepared for the horrors of war. In this savage arena, he would be tested to the limits of his endurance. No one could possibly anticipate the, uh, the tragedy and the sense of loss that uh, the, these uh, men and women uh, experienced. And it was here that he would experience every naval officer's nightmare, the sinking of his boat. Now, some 60 years later, explorer Bob Ballard, the man who found the Titanic, has come here to pull back the veil of history. This was where he was made into a man. He came into this still a boy, and he left the man. For somewhere in these seas is the boat, the story, and the legacy that propelled that young man to become president of the United States. The young man was John F. Kennedy. The boat, PT-109. This is the research vessel Grey Scout. It's on assignment for National Geographic. Hundreds of miles northeast of their home port in Gladstone, Australia, it's steaming through the Coral Sea. A converted supply vessel, it's rigged for underwater exploration. It carries two remote-controlled video robots, side-scanning sonar, and a crew of dedicated technicians. Just enough so it's not too fast, uh -huh. but enough so that the vehicle's gonna want to drift up. It looks like we'll get up in the black and straight early, like seven in the morning or so. They're on their way to the site of some of the most savage naval battles of World War II. The Solomons. An isolated chain of volcanic islands that stretches for nearly a thousand miles across the South Pacific. Here, the Grey Scout will rendezvous with the man who found the Titanic, the Bismarck, and who combed the Black Sea for evidence of Noah's flood, Dr. Robert Ballard. This time, Ballard is after a much smaller prize, but a prize that's no less significant, John F. Kennedy's PT-109. There's so many incredible stories about human struggle and human events, and certainly for President Kennedy, a young man at that time, this was when he became a man. I wanted to come to this spot. I wanted to use this expedition as a way of telling that story. It's in this place, a place crowded with the ghosts of war and the souls of the dead, that the men of PT-109 met their greatest challenge a challenge they might not have survived without the help of others. Let me tell you a story about how we remember the war. We were living in these peaceful islands when the white fella war come along our shores. Like rain, Tapani came. Nothing could stand in their way. Like a flood, they tried to swallow our land. This was really big something. None of, None of us, us had seen. seen. White fella fighting. So many died, big fella fight. We call that war the big death. In this place that was once so hotly contested, Ballard's first stop is the island of Kolombangara the highest volcanic mountain in the Solomons. 
He wants to get a sense of the logistics of battle during the time Kennedy saw action, a time when as many as 10,000 Japanese troops were garrisoned here. March 1943, Allied forces fight to wrest control of the Solomons. For both sides, controlling these islands is vital, and sometimes at all cost. It is into this maelstrom that 25-year-old John F. Kennedy will soon be thrust. Like so many other young men, he joins the Navy. I think uh, the, the generation that went to war were highly idealistic, and no one could possibly anticipate uh, the, uh, the tragedy and the sense of loss that uh, the, these uh, men and women uh, experienced. And they didn't anticipate it. Son of a wealthy man, his father former ambassador to England, Kennedy is part of a family that's well known and at the height of the social world. But young Jack wants to fight, so he volunteers for specialized training on torpedo boats. I think he could have ducked the war if he wanted to. I mean, I think he could have probably gotten out of it because on physical grounds, and uh, he never thought of it. April 1943. After more than four months of waiting, Jack finally gets the assignment he wants, skipper of patrol torpedo boat 109. On the home front, the speedy PT boats had a dashing image, the naval equivalent of the cavalry. They were enormous and they were, you know, they had these big uh, engines in them. They made a throaty noise that would must have uh, um, you know, giving them all a charge. They were fun to watch, and they went like hell. Designed to battle at close quarters with hit-and-run tactics, they are dangerous and reckless, a perfect match for young Jack. But with highly flammable gas tanks, wooden hulls, and unreliable torpedoes, the boats could easily spell death for the men who crewed them. For Jack, they were everything he wanted. Dear Dad and Mother, received your letter today and was glad to hear everyone was well. Things are still about the same here. We had a raid today. I guess it will be more or less routine for another while. Going out every other night for patrol. On the good nights, it's beautiful. The water amazingly phosphorescent. I have an entirely new crew, and when the showdown comes, I'd like to be confident they know the difference between firing a gun and winding their watch. My best love to everyone, Jack. About two months after arriving in the Solomons, Jack and his crew are ordered towards the front. For the young skipper and his crew, the showdown would come soon enough. During the summer of 1943, these straits were crowded with Japanese warships. And the island Bob now explores was held by the enemy. It was from here, a secret post hidden deep in enemy territory that the Allies watched events taking place in the Straits below. A clandestine network of Coast Watchers, working with local scouts, supplied the U.S. Navy with information on Japanese ship and troop movements. Aaron Kumana was one such scout. He was all too eager to help the Allies, even if it meant patrolling Blackett Strait in a dugout canoe. I was young, but I wasn't scared. So even if Tapani was around, I just wander past them and report their activities. We hated Tapani. Aaron worked with Australian Coast Watcher, Lieutenant Arthur Reginald Evans. 
From his hideout on the flanks of the mountain, Evans kept watch on the enemy. And from this vantage point, Evans could see one of the most daring and efficient supply operations of the war. In a tight triangular wedge, Japanese ships would ferry supplies and troops down the strait under cover of darkness. There they would pause briefly to unload, then hightail it out. It was known as the Tokyo Express. One man who has studied these battles is Navy historian Dale Ritter. The Japanese had this supply system down to a science. They could bring the destroyers in here, unload in half an hour, and have them heading back out. They were, they had a very efficient system going. Your typical Japanese destroyer could carry maybe 300 men and maybe 100 tons of cargo if they really crammed it in. 60 tons if they were in a hurry to kick it overboard and boot. They did not want to be caught in this area by aircraft at daylight because they knew what would happen then. August 1st, an urgent message based on radio intercepts. The Tokyo Express may be running that night. Indications Express may run tonight, 1-2. August, stop. Also, heavy barge traffic to Morocco, plot arriving north of Kalapangara at 0030 low. August 2nd, The Tokyo stop. Express barrels In toward Kolombangara. It's a moonless night as Kennedy's 109 and 14 other boats are ordered out to engage the enemy. Their mission, stop the convoy. The boats will attack in groups of three to four each, but they face a formidable foe. As Kennedy's boat and the others move out into Blackett Strait, they are caught in a battle. Poorly planned and largely uncoordinated, the attack is unsuccessful. Not a single torpedo launched hits its mark. Dick Kerasi, skipper of PT-105, was there. There was more confusion in that battle than at any time in the history of PT boats. We had 15 boats. Everybody attacked on their own. Uh, Nobody communicated anything of any value other than really shouts and screams on the radio was all I heard. Sometime after midnight, the boats that have spent their torpedoes head back to base. Kennedy's boat and two others remain in the strait. The Tokyo Express has delivered its goods and is about to head back up the strait sister boats continued to patrol the strait, unaware they are about to meet the Tokyo Express head on. With no running lights, the Tokyo Express is traveling at 30 knots, and Kennedy's boat is idling on one engine. In an instant that passes like a flash in the dark, the Japanese destroyer Amagiri appears out of nowhere and it steams straight for them. Sometime after 2 a.m. August 2nd, 1943, Kennedy's boat has been hit.
He and radio man John McGuire are thrown to the deck. Others are ordered over the side. Seaman Harold Marney from Springfield, Massachusetts, and just 19, is killed. And torpedo man Andrew Kirksey from Reynolds, Georgia, age 25 and a father, is swept away, never to be seen again. Lenny Tom and Barney Ross swim from man to man. Kennedy, shaken but okay, tries to get the men together. Two men call out from the darkness. Jack strips off his boots and pants and swims out to find them. He strikes off to find engineer Patrick Pappy McMahon, who is so badly burned he can't swim. Grasping the straps of his life jacket, Jack hauls him to the wreck. The survivors cling to the wreckage in the dark. The worst mistake we made was uh, assuming, because the 109 uh, supposedly went up in the, uh, one ball of flame, that we didn't go back and look. We should have gone back and looked. We didn't. Unaware they've been given up for dead, the survivors decide to stay in the strait in hope of rescue. They cling to the shattered hull, alive but invisible. Even to Coast Watcher Evans, who is watching from his perch high on the mountain. November, November, Ref, Mike, your 0930 slash 2, Alpha. no survivors so far, stop. Objects still floating between Marusu and Giza, stop. Three torpedoes at Bangor Bang. But Evans and his scouts wouldn't give up. One of those coast watchers was Solomon Islander Buku Gaza. He and Aaron were out that night. I was here, Rami. We heard the explosion. We were on the islands at that time. There were big flames that rose from that boat. As determined as Evans was to find survivors, so Bob is determined to find the wreck of PT-109. Ballard's research vessel, the Grey Scout, ships in from Australia. From what I understand from Danny, uh, we're waiting on immigration. Ballard joins the crew in the Solomon town of Gizo. It's been five days of rough passage, and everyone's anxious to get underway. In his investigation of Blackett Strait, Bob found a patch of sea where he thinks the Tokyo Express must have run, and where the collision of PT-109 most likely occurred. Now he must translate that hunch to his search of the seabed. Hugging the shore over here, comes roaring back, and right here, smack. So the stern drops off. Somewhere in here, it sinks. So our, our area is, what, about seven miles, by five, by 35, 40 square miles. Okay. So what we want to do is lay in an initial set of lines right down the heart of it. The first matter at hand is to survey the seabed. The side scan sonar vehicle, Echo, is lifted over the side. Yeah, okay. Y'all set you? Everybody ready? Okay, bring it out. As it sends out pulses of sound that bounce off the bottom, it creates a topographical map of what's down there. Shapes come into relief. Man-made objects stand out. 
What we're looking for is something that's unnatural, something that's linear, something that's very hard, something that has a shadow. And we're looking for something that stands out, an anomaly, an unnatural thing. But in a region of reefs and strong currents, it's not going to be easy. There's always little monsters in your head. I mean, the first thing is, is the equipment working? And what's the nature of the bottom going to be like? It's, this is not an aircraft carrier. This is not a battleship. This is a, a, a very small target. And are there currents? Are there, we know there's strong currents. Are those currents moving sediments along the bottom? Have they buried it? Is it buried? Is it to, never to be found? I don't like that thought. The sonar search will take days. The team will be working around the clock, and there's no promise of success. August 2nd, 1943. Kennedy and his crew have been in the water for more than 10 hours. But now, with the remains of the hull beginning to sink, they realize they have to make a swim for it. It's a risk. They're in the middle of Blackett Strait, with Japanese all around. They pick a small island some three miles away, gambling it will be free of Japanese. Taking the strap of the burnt man's life vest in his mouth, Kennedy leads the way. The swim will take hours. Exhausted, worried, several men in bad shape, they pull themselves up on the beach. It's a little speck of land called Plum Pudding Island. So here on Plum Pudding, I came ashore right there. Crawled up on the beach. Some of them are so injured, they, they're, they're burnt, they're, they've inhaled fuel, oil. Kennedy's vomiting all of the water in his stomach, the seawater he ingested. Then they stay here, but they realize that they can't stay here. There's no source of water. So they make it across this way. Ah, big spider. So as you come through these islands, you have no idea if there's any Japanese here. So you're almost paralyzed. You don't want to move, and yet you need to move. So you're trying to pick your way through this area, trying not to make a single sound, hoping that no one can detect you. Now here, they're afraid. They know the Japanese are right over here. So they absolutely don't want to go over there. They want to go over here, because they can see palm trees on Olasana. Another man has come to the Solomons to join the expedition, Max Kennedy. He's come as a representative of his family, but for him, it's also a personal mission. My whole life, I've wanted to see this area where my uncle fought and struggled and came through so well. Max's father is Robert Kennedy, Jack's younger brother, and the attorney general during his presidency. In the enormous Kennedy clan, Max grew up immersed in stories of his uncle. An avid diver, Max is trying to get a feel for what it must have been like to fight a war here. I think that really the only way you can even begin to understand what they went through here is to see these islands and to see this ocean. It's such a remarkable time. These waters are littered with the refuse of war, wreckage that whispers stories of men and battles fought here so valiantly. 
I swam from the island that he first swam to. I cannot imagine making that swim under those conditions um, at night, surrounded by the enemy, with your crew injured, knowing that any PT boat captain who comes along, there's probably an 85 or 90 percent chance that if they hear someone, that they're going to shoot first. What Kennedy and the survivors didn't know is that they had been given up for dead by the men back at base. I uh, remember the disappointment that he had that uh, they hadn't come back up the Blackett Straits in order to try and find him, and that uh, uh, this sort of uh, sort of anger at that uh, was really, I think, was uh, something that carried him. He lost control. It was really an With Kennedy and his men lost at sea, the PT captains reconvened at their base in Rondova. Max wants to know what they felt that night, so he and Dick make the journey. When the 109 was sunk, I remember, there was only a very brief discussion that consisted of the base commander asking one of the two boat captains who were within 100 yards of the 109 when it was hit, should we go back? Was there any point in going back? And the boat captain shook his head and said, uh, the boat exploded in one ball of flame. No one could be left. Nobody uh, ever talked about them being gone? No, no. Nobody ever talked, Max, about anybody who was gone. That was a subject that wasn't discussed. You just did not sit around and say what nice guys they were and how you missed them. You kept that, all that to yourself. Uh, and even in yourself, you try to forget it as soon as possible. You couldn't think about that. You had too many other things to think about. So you just didn't. Back on the research vessel, the Gray Scout, the sonar search carries on. They are working a 35 square mile grid, running lines up and down Blackett Strait. After three days of mapping the sea bottom, they have come up with a number of promising what targets. On, uh, scales on each of those? Ooh, One in particular thing. could be a vital clue to the movement of ships when the Tokyo Express That's ran these shadow. waters. That looks nice. Right lobe, right where it's supposed to be. Five meters. It's a lone shadow that looks too regular to be anything but man-made. I think we're going to be busy in this neck of the woods for a few days, sorting of things out. OK, Todd, pick it up easy. Ballard determines it's time to send down the cameras for a closer look. So they launch Little Herc, the remotely operated robot. Connected to the ship via a couple of thousand feet of fiber optic cable, it carries a high definition camera to the ocean depths. They are working at over 1,200 feet. At depths like these with difficult currents, precision is key. At first, a debris trail. But little by little, as they follow it up, a wreck begins to take shape. It's, it's, it's come left. Cad rise up a little. It's off to your left. Pivot left. Armaments come into frame. Rusted weapons, twisted metal. It's not a PT boat, but it could be a destroyer. Its weapons, appearance, and location indicate it could be the Kiroshio, a Japanese warship that went down in these waters after getting caught in a minefield. Since Bob is trying to find the sea routes upon which the Japanese traveled, this could be a vital clue that would help him find his way to the wreck of PT-109. These guys probably had a highway that they were all running on. 
Well, that highway will lead to the collision. So the, the ability to find a, a destroyer that was running on that highway, well, I can extrapolate right up. So it gave me a lot of information that helps me now search for the collision site. So I'm, you know, very pleased. <laughs> With two men lost and others seriously injured, Kennedy knows he must make a plan. For any prospect of a speedy rescue has been all but abandoned. Proximity of, of death and life, physical struggle and the exertion, um, the clear uncertainty as to uh, the, uh, the future, um, and uh, still the, uh, the will and the perseverance. Uh, that uh, were so powerful and rooted so deeply in his soul, I think, uh, were the forces that really uh, kept that team together. But there was a ray of hope on the horizon. Solomon Islander Buku Gaza, along with Aaron Kumana, managed to make contact with Australian coast watcher Evans, who still hadn't given up. Evans sent them out to search the coast for survivors. They found nothing. That same night, Kennedy swims alone out into Ferguson Passage, hoping to hail a passing PT boat. at base, a memorial service is being held for Kennedy and his crew. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He guides me paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Kennedy swims and swims out into the passage, treading water half the night. He hopes against hope. But again, there's nothing, not a PT boat in sight. Lonely, exhausted, and in desperation, he rejoins his men. It really made an impression on himself about his own kind of steel and his own uh, inner kind of, uh, of toughness. I think it had a very important uh, uh, impact in terms of, of how he perceived himself for the rest of his life. I think he was a different individual and uh, made a very important mark on his, uh, on his character. After two days, with their food supply dwindling and their condition worsening, Kennedy decides they have to move camp. He leads his men back in the water to swim for over a mile to another more promising island. It took an awful lot of heroics to do what he did. They were concerned about whether the Japanese were going to spot them before they got back to the, got to the island, and then they were also concerned when they got on the island whether that somebody would be able to find out that they're there and they come over, send a Japanese people over there to to annihilate them. Days of searching the strait have yielded a number of targets, and none have paid off. But one sonar target all alone in the strait sets the wheels in motion. Somewhere south of here, the uh, ship sinks. And in our total search area, we only have one target, and that's that guy. But it's definitely not a rock. But that's big enough and strong enough and isolated enough. So this is our best shot, target 21, at finding Let's do it. Drum roll now. All right, 
Give him hell. Ah! <laughs> Let's go. Not on the deck. They launch Little Herc, the video robot. It begins its descent. That means all of the telling this is in the general area where there's a target. No one is sure what they'll find. But off by itself, on an empty quarter of the seabed, one lone target rings true. At first, Bob is skeptical. But slowly, a shape comes out of the gloom. It looks like a torpedo tube, rusted with time. No one is sure. Okay. Yeah, that's... Can't record that. Everything's to the air east. Could it be part of a PT boat buried under the sand? Information. They'll have to wait for the experts. August 5th. After three days of waiting, the shipwrecked crew is desperate. Fears of being discovered have grown with each day and rescue seems no closer at hand. But all that is about to change. After days of searching, two young island scouts paddle towards shore. Evans sent us out to rescue Kennedy. One day, while Buke and I were checking out some wreckage, we came across two men. At first, we thought they were Japanese, and we ran away. It wasn't until we met up with the rest of the crew that we learned it was Captain Kennedy. As the men wait in the brush on Olasana Island, two natives appear. It takes a few moments, but finally they realize their good fortune. Their salvation has finally come. When we got to the island, Kennedy was worried. He wanted to send a message to Rendova, but he had no paper. So I told Aaron to climb a coconut tree. I husked the skin out. I thought this would do fine. Native knows position. He can pilot. Eleven alive. Need small boat. Kennedy. But how would we look after it while at sea? So I said, I'll use it as a bail. And if I was met by the enemy, I'll scratch out the message, then wait for my death. It's my orders. Ensign Lenny Tom also pens a message on a small scrap of paper. For Buku and Aaron, it was to be a 38-mile canoe trip. Ken, Ken, this is GSE. Do you copy over? Sending transmission now. 20 a.m. GSE, message Echo, to Ken. Delta, whiskey, 11 Charlie, survivors, Mike, PT boat November. on Gross Island. Stop. WG, Have GSE. sent food and letter. Great news. Stop. Come here about India. Commander PT base received a message just after yours from survivors by native. Stop. They gave their position and news that some of them. Upon hearing of the survivors, Evans dispatches more of his scouts. 
the crew, bearded, gaunt, half-starved and with festering wounds, feasts on yams, potatoes, and roast beef hash. It's the first real meal they've had in six days. But the men of PT-109 have pulled through. I think everybody was elated and couldn't be more pleased. They were found. Here was Lenny Tom, and here was Barney Ross, and uh, Jack, and, you know, three of the most admired fellas and all the great enlisted men they have on board. And I think it was like, uh, you know, a miracle that had taken place. With the meal completed, Kennedy sets off to summon the rescue boats. When Kennedy writes home, it's clear he hasn't lost much of his old spark. Dear folks, this is just a short note to tell you I am alive and not kicking, in spite of any reports that you may happen to hear. It was believed otherwise for a few days, so reports or rumors may have gotten back to you. Fortunately, they misjudged the durability of the Kennedy. And I'm back at the base now, and I'm okay. As soon as possible, I shall try to give you the whole story. Much love to you all. Jack. Ever since the day when he rescued Kennedy, Aaron has waited to be reunited. And finally, that day has come. After the rescue, Kennedy promised he would meet us again. When he became president, he invited us to visit him. But when we got to the airport, we were met by a clerk who said we couldn't go. Bihuku and I spoke no English. My feelings went for bed. Sometime later, we heard Kennedy died. I sat down with his pizza and cried, knowing he was dead. My sadness was great. I would never meet him. His promise would never come out. I still think of Kennedy. Uh, Max, we'd like to introduce you to Aaron, one of the rescuers of your uncle, the President Chef Kennedy. This is Aaron. Hi, Aaron. So nice to see you. Thank you so much. Sixty years of waiting are over. Is this your son here? Raymond Albert. Raymond Albert. And your name? Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy? So old. <laughs> Come on. How old are you? Bizarro Mkobia. <laughs> About 80? 80 or 90. 80 or 90. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Max wants to meet the other rescuer. The two old scouts haven't seen each other for years. They remember their days as scouts for the Allies. I don't know. I don't know. Mama never tell me so. Papa would let me go. Max has brought a gift from the Kennedy family. This is a bust of Captain Kennedy. Captain Kennedy. I give it to you on behalf of my whole family. Yeah. An honor. Thank you. And we have one for each of you. He has also brought a letter from Jack's last surviving brother, Edward. President Kennedy often spoke of the great courage of those who came to his aid 
and he never forgot you. Uh, not a day goes by that I don't think of him and miss him. And it means a great deal to know that my brother is still remembered with affection in the Solomon Islands. With my warmest wishes, uh, Ted Kennedy. If you can, you come back to see me, look at me, eh? I can't wait to come back. I want to bring my children back to meet you. Very glad. of the discovery has gone out. The historians and experts arrive. They all want to look at Bob's find. A judgment will be left to naval historian and forensic expert, Dale Ritter. You know, you read about something all your life, you study it, you try and imagine what it's like, then Beyond your wireless dreams, you're there, you're flying over it, you're looking down on it, you're thinking, this is where the Tokyo Express ran. This is where we ran our ships, ships up to intercept the guys off of Kula Gulf. You know, the ships that sailed here, the men that sailed here. You know, it, it is, it gives you a feeling I can't even begin to describe. Right. I'm just thinking of how this destroyer passed through this guy. That's a pretty big thing going through, yeah. So here's the president right here in the cockpit. And he's the, the, the Japanese destroyer struck just as a miracle that he didn't die. It struck right there. One school of thought has it cutting right across here, okay, and severing the ship into two pieces. Another school of thought, they think that if anything is sliced off hard here, that, that most of the boat didn't sink right off. And it's the slice theory that seems to be supported by the evidence. 60 years of speculation about what happened that night boil down to this. Steel against flimsy plywood and gasoline. Everything rides on the view of the experts. Now this has got a tip on it. Can you swing? Okay. All right, we want you to get down. Let's see, that almost looks like fins on a torpedo. That looks like a fin, two counter rotating props. That's like a torpedo. Yeah. Well, you got a torpedo and you got a torpedo launcher. It smells like, looks like, Oh, talks is, like, um, acts um, like. It's yeah, beginning the, the to look placement, like, yes. it's just yeah. too extraordinary. She's tapering back the way she should. We got a fin in front of twin contra rotating props. Yeah. Boy, yeah. you couldn't ask for better no. ideas. So, what do we got? We have a torpedo tube off of one PT-109. Oh, it has yeah, a no, Mark 8 torpedo inside. No, no, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. The, the dimensions are right. Everything is perfect. When you get involved in a project like this, you always hope you can add something to, to the story, and I think we've, we've done that. We've uh, got closure on it. PT-109 is right there, and uh, that's sort of nice. One scenario has it that if the sand could be moved, things would look like this. 
While this does bring some closure to the story of PT-109, what happened that fateful night may never be known. The Navy will not allow what it considers a grave to be touched. So PT-109 may at last rest in peace forever at the bottom of the sea. The expedition over, the objectives achieved, Bob's found what he came to look for. As one boat is being put to rest, another is taking shape. Yuku's nephew and grandson are preparing a gift. Another kind of boat that carried another kind of warrior. It's a dugout canoe, just like the one the old scout used when he and Aaron risked their lives to rescue Kennedy. It's a gift from Buku, so people in America will remember the story. I'm making this canoe so people in Washington can come look, so people will hear about the late President Kennedy, so people will remember the story of what happened here. This is my canoe, and I make it for the memorial of J.F. Kennedy from Biuku, Gaza. Aaron has his own way of remembering the story and his part in history. On a ridge top on his island, he has built a memorial all his own, just for himself, to remember his friend, Jack Kennedy. When I heard he became president, this Kennedy, by way of my tradition, I appointed him into the position of chief. As chief, he decreed, I will send someone among my people to reach the moon. So it happened. They put up this flag here. The flag still sits on the moon, as the president dreamt it would be. So the chiefship of Kennedy will remain here, even after I die. Strong as ever, as hard as this rock, I always am thinking of him. Of the 13 men who served on PT-109, two were lost in the collision. Pappy McMahon survived his wounds and went on to work for the post office. Lenny Tom died when a train struck his car in 1946. John F. Kennedy was assassinated November 22, 1963. The last surviving crew member died in a hospital August 21, 2001. Let the word go forth from this time and place that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, 